This afternoon, Bruce Hawker and Graham Morris. Uh, thank you both very much for joining me. I want to just start on APEC. We were just looking at Tom's report there. And look, to be clear, it's always important that world leaders meet when they can. Uh, this is uh, important to diplomacy and all sorts of things. But they just seem to spend a lot of time this weekend talking about Donald Trump without really <laughs> knowing what's going to happen when he becomes president. Um, Bruce, I don't know. What do you think? Was it a worthwhile gathering there in Peru? Well, I think they probably expected a different uh, outcome in the election. And you can't go around Probably changing the right. date for these, uh, for these meetings. But it's true. The incoming president's going to be so important in so much of what APEC has to discuss, particularly when it comes down to the issue of free trade and you know, the Trans-Pacific mm. Partnership, that it's an, an almost pointless exercise uh, to be having a discussion in his absence. As we know, uh, when it comes to domestic politics, there are lots of checks and balances on the president. When it comes to international relationships, it tends to be a much more powerful hand that he can play. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there was much that came out of it. And by uh, Malcolm Turnbull's platitudes there at the end, we all live on the one planet, we're all big and small and we all count. It sounded to me like yeah. uh, nothing much came out of it either for him. And, and, and what, <laughs> Graham, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, effusive in uh, talking about the Obama um, presidency, and, you know, full of praises, he goes out the door uh, and basically trying to say, don't worry, uh, Trump might be different to the candidate Trump that we saw during the election <laughs> campaign. I don't know. What, what did you make of it? Well, look, it is very important that our Prime Minister meet with world leaders. And, yeah, Trump wasn't there, but there were, you know, whatever it was, 10 or 11 other ones. Yep. And, and he, he seemed to do a nice job. And they all agreed on the freer trade thing. But, <laughs> as it turned out, it was like having a game of cricket or any code of football and they forgot to bring the ball. Um, <laughs> you know, the Trump, Trump, Trump just wasn't there, and yet he is the fellow that's going to decide the future of everything they decided. So... <laughs> Uh, it, look, it was a bit unfortunate, but it's an important meeting in its own right, yeah. even if the guts of it can't be decided no, until Master Trump turns up. Not much they can do about that. Now, that, that, that was really the easy part of the week for Malcolm Turnbull. He comes back here with uh, the final two weeks of Parliament and a lot to get through as far as the government's concerned. Um, there's you know, maybe half a dozen bills they'd really like to get through from refugee bans and uh, PPL, pay parental leave changes and so on. But, Graham. These two IR bills, they are the most important by far, aren't they? Look, there's half a dozen things that are really important for the government in the way it governs. And, and to help the troops get back to the electorates and say, look, we're doing our job, and even to help the crossbenchers say, look, we have done our bit for the country if they, if they get through. Um, they are important in that sense and to show that the government is governing. Politically, I don't think they change a vote. And I think that's a whole different strategy that has to be looked at. This is simply governing and governing well. It's actually not changing votes. But I'll that's tell you a what, if, thing. if they don't get these IR bills through or they're pushed off till next well, year... Well, if they don't, don't get them up, it is, it is disappointing for the troops because industrial relations is important to my side of politics. Um, sorting out some of those welfare things is important. Sorting out the refugee, yeah. the illegal migrant thing is, is important. Yeah. Well, um, but, but is the world going to collapse if they're slightly delayed? No. But there'll be huge disappointment. Bruce, objectively, what do you think would be a good finish to the year for the Turnbull government? Uh, I think if they could gain some momentum uh, in the last two weeks, that would be a big plus for Malcolm Turnbull because it's something he's... Uh, failed to do to date. Uh, he's obviously trying to position himself around the industrial relations legislation and around some of these immigration issues uh, to present himself as a strong leader, probably more in the Tony Abbott mould than uh, what we would have thought was going to be the Malcolm Turnbull mould. But that's pretty much where he seems to be landing these days more and more, as pretty much you know, uh, more of the same of what we had before. So that would be a big plus if he was able to, I think, as Graeme said, give the troops something to cheer about on his own side. From Labor's perspective, uh, it's now in a, they're now in a position where the less the government uh, achieves, really, the better it is for them, um, which is essentially where the uh, Abbott opposition was taking things as well. If you can stop the government being effective and getting their legislative program through, People start to get frustrated with them. They start to see them as being, uh, you know, ineffective, inept, and and that's bad for government and therefore just, good for opposition. Just, Bruce, on, 
On the flip side question for Bill Shorten, uh, the IR issues, um, he clearly doesn't want to talk much about, does he? Uh, particularly the ABCC and when no. it comes to the things that CFMEU has done and all of this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, he'll look for anything to try and get the agenda onto something else, 457s, uh, for example, last week. Yeah. Um, and, you know, clearly going after Peter Dutton uh, this week. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there may be grounds to do so. But it, this is a vulnerability for Shorten, isn't it? I think the ABCC has always been a big problem for Labor because it's very hard to objectively and convincingly uh, come out and say a, an oversight body is a bad thing in an industry where there's been so much corruption, not just on the employee side, but on the employer side as well. And, you know, I'm on the record mm. as saying that I think that this is something which Labor should allow to happen and try to turn into a virtue, because I think it'll be something that the they're government... They're not listening will... to you, though, Bruce. No, they're not. And the, and the government will come <laughs> back and, though, and they will attack the opposition if this legislation does get held up, and they'll lay the blame yeah. full, uh, fully at its own feet. And I think Absolutely. that's a shame. I think that's a shame from Labor's yeah, and, perspective. And... Speaking of the unions, because I know, Bruce, you've got strong views on this, what do you think about this new uh, mob trying to... Uh, peel away members from the shoppies, the SDA, one of the biggest, most powerful unions in the country. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the SDA uh, obviously is a very important part of the Labor apparatus on the industrial side. It's a big supporter financially of the Labor Party yep. and you cannot ignore that. Uh, it is also an extremely conservative body that has basically stood in the way of a lot of progressive political uh, moves inside the Labor governments and Labor oppositions over the years. I've got not a lot of time for uh, a lot of the values that the SDA espouses and frankly I'd be surprised if a lot of its members do either. So this development is going to be very interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how mm. demarcation issues come into play these days because clearly there's a major demarcation issue here uh, and I think part of it is that this body is not actually going to register as a union in the first instant but rather as no, some but, registered organisation. That's but, right, uh, that's right. Graham, what, what do you think about this? Because it's interesting. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, another bloody union. That's all we need. <laughs> um, yeah, look, look, the, the, look the, the, the shoppies... The, it, it means, it probably means that the last piece of community conscience um, in the trade union movement is now being challenged. You know, you, you, yes, the, the shoppies have had a rough couple of years with a few agreements, but overall you could actually rely on that union to do some stuff and do a deal and they would stick to it, you know, unlike some of these other union thugs. Um, look, I think it's disappointing, but at the moment it is three people making a noise and say, hey, look at me, I'm a union. Really? Now, uh, it, it, well, yeah, and look, we don't see the sort of problems that we've seen around the CFMEU with the shoppies, uh, that's for sure. I just want to get your thoughts, uh, mm. Graeme, particularly from you, George Brandis. Uh, now, a couple of interesting things that he's caught there saying, uh, giving a fairly blunt, blunt assessment of um, Tim Nichols and the uh, state opposition in Queensland. Not sure if many will disagree with that. Uh, but the LNP, maybe they need to revisit the uh, the merged LNP. What did you what did you think of that? Well, the first thing is obviously beware of microphones again, mm -hmm. Senator Brandis. Um, look, when you look at what he was saying, he, he's he's actually right, and that is, look, the Labor Party is not travelling well. The coalition is struggling. It's still twelve months off to an election, yeah. but the rising the rise is in one nation. And I think whether it's the Queensland state election or the federal, federal government, you know, one of the big parts of the political strategy is how do you get the, those first preferences or second preferences from one nation back? As to, you know, whether or not the, the coalition should split again up there, I didn't like them being joined in the first place. So I like always that. think the Liberal Party needs a strong party to its right, which is yeah. normally the National Party. But now that that egg has been scrambled... I don't think you're going to undo well, it. Bruce, what do you think? Because his point is the return under Labor of compulsory preferential voting means they should revisit the LNP merger. Would they do better with two parties? If, if, if you've got to allocate preferences mm. when you go in to vote, mm. would the Conservative side of politics do better with two parties, Liberal and National? Uh, in the past, that hasn't been my experience uh, before they were a merged entity. And, you know, I worked on that big campaign in 1998 when Peter yep. Beattie won... Uh, despite the presence of Pauline Hanson, uh, I, I don't really see that as being a powerful argument. He might be worried about the ascendancy inside the national part of the old uh, National Party in Queensland over the uh, urban Liberals, 
and that might be part of what he's really concerned about. But I don't actually see any great advantage in that. You know, they will distribute their preferences and people will vote according to the way in which they feel they should. So in the case in 1998, for example, it was uh, in the country areas, people voted uh, for, for one nation and they were preferenced to and by from the, uh, from, the, from the coalition parties and that went down very badly in the cities. And in the end, Beattie fell across the line because there were slightly more votes in the cities for him than in the country. So I don't see any great advantage in this for Brandis at all. We better go to a break. Uh, Bruce Hawker, Graham Morris, thanks very much for that. We'll catch you both next week. Hey, David.